All right. So now I have the pleasure of welcoming um, entrepreneurs who are doing very interesting things. Uh, we will start our lightning round session for them. The first up is a central Pennsylvanian uh, out of the Harrisburg area. His name is Ian Kansky. He's the president of Intag. Give him a warm round of applause, please. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Ian. Uh, I am the president and co-founder of Intag. We are a biotech developer working in food and agriculture. We are a team of 10, and uh, we are early stage investor backed, founded and uh, headquartered in Harrisburg, about 30 minutes north of here. We are commercializing patented technology, primarily in North America and Europe. Our core patents are focused on the use of biology, uh, microbiology to eliminate dependencies on synthetic chemicals uh, in the food supply and specifically in fertilizers. Uh, our patents, uh, our technology can also be used to enhance nutrition in crops, uh, accelerate plant growth, and can even allow us to build completely recirculating systems that discharge no waste uh, and no water into the environment or, or down drains. Uh, we have built close to, uh, over 50 systems now uh, in a, basically a, th a three-hour radius around our headquarters in Harrisburg, uh, from Pittsburgh uh, to Philadelphia to D.C. and all the uh, coal, steel, and farmland in between. Uh, this is one of our recent projects. This is a 6,000-square-foot uh, ag tech experience center built at the headquarters of CCA, which is a cyber school with around uh, close to 10,000 students. Uh, this is a system where trainees are working on growing produce for the Hilton Harrisburg. Uh, they are also uh, learning in cohorts, the student cohorts. We built three industry-grade laboratories bolted onto this system. Uh, one is a CRISPR-Cas9 genetics lab. Uh, a tissue culture lab and lighting trials research laboratory. We offer the systems, the, the ongoing training, and ultimately our focus is on licensing our intellectual property to channel partners and larger food and ag companies. The overall field that we're focused on is controlled environment agriculture. This is high-tech, technology-enabled farming. It includes vertical farming, uh, high-tech greenhouses, hydroponics, aquaponics, and aeroponics. And this is a sector that's got a lot of really important drivers fueling it towards its inflection point, uh, particularly here in the US. Uh, the potential, the ability to climate proof our food supply by growing in controlled environments. Uh, these are, the, these are uh, methods that require a fraction of the water and a fraction of, of the real estate to produce high yield. Now, the ultimate case study in our industry, uh, it's kind of just getting off the ground here in the US, uh, but it has been used, these controlled environments have been used at massive scale in Europe successfully for decades. Uh, here in the US, for context, we have around 3,000 uh, square feet, uh, or 3,000 acres uh, in the US. Europe has a half a million. But the U.S. entrepreneurial engine is now engaged uh, in just in the last four years. Major companies are fueling this sector in the U.S. And the global industry is really bracing for a wave of robotics, automation, uh, to, to really set the pace, particularly coming from the U.S. Uh, as we engage in this sector. So it's an exciting time. Uh, but ag tech, like many of the other technologies being talked about today, uh, democratized uh, computing power, uh, additive manufacturing, robotics, has the potential on one hand to disrupt industries, change jobs, eliminate jobs here, create jobs over here. Um, but it also has the very real potential to decentralize productivity in ways that could be hugely impactful for communities. If we can bridge that knowledge gap, so like any other company in an emerging field, uh, in a new technology area, uh, we have the challenge of a labor pool, uh, uh, looking for a labor pool, looking for talent. We decided at our inception that we were going to tackle this head on. We decided that even though over here our primary goal is to commercialize and patent uh, intellectual property, we were going to build a robust workforce and education strategy into the core of our business model. Our flagship project was built uh, in a uh, unused land behind a public school in an economically distressed area in an urban food desert. 
through partnerships. That project had $5.4 million in economic impact in its first 24 months. We'd started with a half a million dollars in funding. Uh, it's hosted f uh, government and business leaders from 14 countries, and we saw just incredible levels of engagement as student teams work together in entrepreneurship, learning first to grow crops, uh, to grow food, to uh, maintain the supply chain from seed to harvest. Then we got reports out of coal country in uh, south of Pittsburgh, in some of our systems, again, 50 plus distributed across the state, uh, students that were learning to drop sensors into their intag systems, learning to push uh, students as early as third and fifth grade, push real-time data up to uh, a web service with open source web tools, citizen scientists. We then realized there was something much more important going on here, which was that all of these technologies uh, were being demystified for students through tangible application of something they could relate to, food. Suddenly, the Internet of Things was so much more tangible. Lots of sensors put into a system, and they were learning an important lesson about life. That technology is most useful when it supports important things in, in human systems. So I will stop my presentation here with an appeal uh, to those in the audience in robotics and automation. Come, please join us, plug your gear in. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can, you can take a seat. Yeah, that'd be great. So, Thank you to Ian. Uh, up next, we have another great announcer, or uh, announcer, uh, presenter, who is also from a central Pennsylvania company. Uh, it's Assam Abadir of Aspire Ventures. He's founder and CEO, and please give him a warm round of applause. Okay. All right, we'll start here. Good morning. Uh, so if you'll humor me for a moment, I'd love to tell you just a little anecdote that has colored my entire career and perception of AI. Uh, in 1996, in my first job uh, after law school and MIT, I was uh, waiting to take my bar exam. And I was working for a management consulting company and there was a project in New York that was going horribly uh, wrong. So a uh, big media company was merging and there was a data uh, merge that needed to happen between the database of the company they were acquiring and this very, very large deal was dependent on the merge and there was a team of people from our company uh, working on it for a couple of months and it was going nowhere. And uh, they just needed more resources. There was a dearth of engineering, so they took the guy who was a management consultant waiting to take the bar exam, shoved him into this project, and I got on it, and I convinced somebody within the media company to give me server time in some cluster, and I got the data merge uh, done, but it took two days of computing time, and uh, the access control to that server cluster, I had violated some security protocol and they called in my boss and uh, put me in front of an EVP at this big media company where I got yelled at. And he asked me, why did I do that? And I said, well, there was no other way to do this. We didn't have enough people. It was gonna cost, I forget what the calculation was, a couple hundred thousand dollars to keep the whole team going. And we got this done in two days. And that was the first time I did AI, and if we fast forward 25 years later, uh, I've realized that all these really cool things that I've uh, been lucky enough to do have really just resulted in people, kids watching more TV or buying more stuff. And so in 2013, I sold an apps platform to Intel and then uh, after that thought, I'd really like to create a, a greater impact. And so we started a venture firm called Aspire Ventures. And it's private equity and venture capital directed at impact areas by infusing AI into them. Our uh, first private equity fund was put together to build the Uber of healthcare. Uh, we've had some 
great portfolio companies and uh, transactions in there. Uh, in 2017, we partnered with Capital Blue Cross and Penn Medicine on an early stage accelerator called the Smart Health Innovation Lab to bring AI and really amazing R&D resources, clinical resources to help startups develop precision medicine technologies. And uh, this year, we are piloting in Lancaster a whole new health experience that is driven by AI-based uh, technologies and uh, our portfolio. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. It's called Clio Health. It uh, represents the aggregation of our uh, first portfolio. And within that portfolio, we've had some really amazing uh, AI, AI accomplishments. Uh, most recently, we had a strategic transaction around our diabetes company, Tempo Health. And uh, Tempo, to our knowledge, is the only company in the diabetes space where AI has beat the best doctors in the world in managing glycemic blood sugars for diabetics, and the doctors themselves published those results. Uh, we have other companies that power the analytics of 50,000 doctors and many millions of patients nationwide. Uh, another company of ours, uh, Connection Health, is developing AI-driven, uh, I guess people describe it as the Star Trek medicine experience. You step in and there's a you know, virtual doctor that helps assess you. So really cool things, but the real reason we've done this is to change the healthcare experience. So I often say that healthcare hasn't had its Amazon moment. You know, that moment in time, like Amazon achieved in retail, where you just change the experience. And what will that experience be like? So in the near future, and what we're piloting in Lancaster uh, this year, is an app that will guide you to better health. So the core of the guidance comes from the World Health Organization's Healthy Life Index. But now it's, uh, the Healthy Life Index is a long questionnaire asking you, you know, uh, how do you feel? Are you stressed? Things like that. But we've actually uh, tied that to biometrics coming off of things like Apple Watches so we can guide you to better health. Uh, there's interactivity in the app, so 24-7, you can interact with care navigators that are supplemented by AI to guide you to where you need to go in, in the health system, so no more waiting in lines going to urgent care or EDs when you don't need to. Uh, being able to interact directly with doctors who have all of your data on hand, uh, or going to that Star Trek-like uh, uh, healthcare experience whether it's at a local pharmacy or in your office, so that you don't actually have to go to the urgent care or the ED. And we're branding this experience Clio Health, and it's coming uh, to this local area here pretty soon. So the really important aspect is better outcomes, bringing people these new kinds of experiences, so embedded uh, in this are really, really cool uh, additional apps that can analyze your body, uh, give you the best screenings that uh, only pro athletes get right now at a cost of $5,000, uh, you know, but doing it in a minute for anybody anywhere. So we have a broad range of apps that come from our portfolio. That portfolio is driven by the startups going through uh, the accelerators and funded by uh, Aspire and Penn Medicine, LGH and Capital Blue Cross. And to achieve this, you know, if you go back to my opening story, you know, that was a story of not having enough labor, uh, really not having enough resources to do something in the traditional way. And if you look at small towns, or even Silicon Valley, there are not enough AI engineers. Uh, in medicine, there are not enough diabetes doctors, dermatologists, uh, you name it. That's why the wait times are so long. So we've had to innovate new structures that enable 
collaboration amongst these really, really smart people to accelerate startups much faster. So the Smart Health Innovation Lab is uh, just that structure in Lancaster. We brought through um, amazing companies like Neuroflow on the behavioral health side uh, to enable, uh, you know, or to address one of the largest crises right now, uh, which is the stress level uh, of young people resulting in suicides and um, young girls cutting themselves. Uh, Tempo Health on the diabetes side, One Ohm on drug gene interaction, uh, Imovi, which is a really cool knee brace you put on for 15 seconds, and it gives you a dynamic MRI of the knee instead of sitting in a huge machine for 45 minutes. So uh, these are the things that we're bringing through our local community and uh, doing it collaboratively with the healthcare institutions around here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. If you want to please oh, grab a spot. So I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, who is based out of Pittsburgh. Her name is Jessica Tribus. She is the uh, Chief Games Officer of SimCoach Games. Please, a warm welcome for her. I'm a dancing monkey. Good morning, I'm Jessica Tribus. I am the founder of a Carnegie Mellon spin-out, 2005 Carnegie Mellon spin-out called SimCoach Games, which delivers video games for workforce development and training. So we're really looking at the skills gap issue in our country, how we have millions of jobs but a lot of people aren't aware of what those jobs are. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> my feet are so I'm losing my bruised. slides there. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, just running around like crazy. So our vision is that oh. all youth would be empowered to pursue oh the best career paths to fit their unique interests and aptitudes. And we do this by delivering fun video games that inspire youth to careers and connect them to relevant opportunities in their region. We've built a ton of games. We've got them in construction for IT careers, advanced manufacturing. We even have soft skills games. These are around career awareness or to assess aptitudes or for skill development and even soft skills. We wrap this into something called the SimCoach Skill Arcade. This is where we can pull data, gameplay data, and understand how you're doing in these games, but it's also the point of connection uh, for relevancy, relevant information about maybe wage data, uh, opportunities for training, and also what the careers are. So for instance, if I play a spatial reasoning game that would path me to advanced manufacturing, maybe as a machinist in Pittsburgh, and you in Western PA, and you play something here in Central PA, we would get different information and reaffirmed in different ways depending on how we play the game. So a lot of people light up and they say, oh, of course, this makes sense. Everyone's playing Call of Duty and Fortnite anyway. Uh, they might as well be playing wholesome games, and we, industry, want to be associated with games because that uh, is how we're going to communicate with the next generation. Um, and that's certainly a perspective, especially from folks that, that don't play games. But what folks inherently that play games inherently know well is why we're using games. So I wanted to just remind people of that. And so games... Uh, what we realized in grad school way back when is that good game design parallels proven principles for how we learn and communicate effectively. Games are a really great framework for conveying story and context for delivering lessons. There are clear goals. You have a clear role. There's feedback. There's scoring. You're measuring something. You're measuring progress. But the number one thing about games is that you as a player have agency in your world. You can have choice, consequence. You can put on someone else's shoes. You can come to your own conclusions. 
Games work because they're really about empowerment. And of course, you know, there is equitable penetration of smartphones in this country. And so that makes sense as a way to deliver these. So games are working to recruit people uh, into fields. And we look at some examples. This uh, is a screenshot of America's Army, something that the US Army put out way back in 2002 or started to recruit people to boot camp. They used this game and had a significant reduction of folks that would drop out of boot camp because they played this game and it pre-qualified them. They knew what they were going to get into. I recently saw an article uh, on NPR last month about women and minorities unintentionally finding um, trucking careers because they were playing uh, video games. And uh, one of our own examples is that, at least in Western Pennsylvania, we've recruited more pre-qualified women and minorities to construction trades. And the last one here, and this one I really want to encourage you guys to try, it's called Buoys, A Ghost's Code. Uh, it was, it's a free app on the app stores. It was developed to recruit people into coding boot camps and coding classes. But what happened, uh, this was unintentional, is that it became um, with 100% <laughs> accuracy so far, a predictor of how well you would do in those boot camps. So from our work with government and industry and schools, we know that the career awareness and the skills gap um, is a big deal. A lot of kids and families just, just don't know what's, what's out there and what's available. And of course, as we talked about in the last two days, one big reason is because the applications for skill sets uh, are changing rapidly. You know, maybe we should ask youth what problems they want to solve instead of what they want to be. Uh, just in our business, game development, we don't necessarily need more research engineers, but we do need people that know how to code games and program games. We need people that can operate 3D modeling and animation software, not necessarily MFAs, and people that can play games and troubleshoot bugs, which takes a mathematical mind, but not necessarily a, a PhD, and of course, we need people that uh, can be team players, can collaborate, and can communicate well. So our industry doesn't represent the, the big hiring industries, but these jobs, uh, these skill sets are uh, applicable and, and transferable as an example. So how do we keep up with all this change in industry? How do we equip schools and educators? How do we adjust policy to solve this problem of career awareness? I think. One thing that really gets lost is the individual and, and their role in all this. And I think that youth are going to be a big part of this solution. There's a cool model in healthcare that I learned about a few years ago from some of the games we were developing, patient center care model, which I'm sure you've heard of, which puts the patient at the center of their care. So you have industry, you have doctors, you have surgeons, you have pharma all around you, but you are the CEO of your health. And it's proven with that model to have better quality outcomes at a lower cost. So I've been thinking a lot about this model and trying to think about, you know, and hope, hopefully games can help in this way, but think about how to put an individual at the center of their job path and really inspire that confidence, motivate, spark that, that awareness, and reaffirm them, you know, empowering them to be the CEO of their health. Thank you. I'm sorry, of their job not, and their health. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. I would love to have you take a seat. Next up, uh, we have Gino Rooney, all the way from Chicago, uh, from he is the co-founder and CTO of Blue Crew. So please give him a warm welcome as well. Sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I don't have as uh, fun of a title as Chief Games Officer, but uh, super excited to be here uh, nonetheless. Yeah, so I'm Gino, 
uh, co-founder and CTO of Blue Crew, an on-demand staffing platform for hourly work. And let me start by just saying how excited I am to be here. I think the concept of this conference is really cool, and the topic of automation and AI and how it impacts the workforce in the heartland is a super important topic, and it's something that we at Blue Crew uh, think about pretty often. Uh, before diving into those topics in more detail, I wanted to first discuss a little bit more about what Blue Crew does. Um, so our mission as a on-demand staffing platform for hourly work is to make staffing and employment more accessible for both people involved, the companies and uh, the job seekers. And I, this comes from personal experience. I worked in a warehouse my college and high school summers for the better half of it, and I got to work side by side with pickers and packers, shipping clerks that were working you know, 40, 50 hours a week, juggling multiple jobs, trying to make ends meet. Uh, and one thing I realized while I was there was just how difficult of a process it is for hiring managers within the, warehou within the warehouse to be able to find uh, qualified folks when they need it, and how difficult it was for uh, the coworkers I was working alongside to find work when they wanted to have access to it. The truth of the matter is that hiring hourly workers is hard. The process of going through either a staffing agency or running this as an internal you know, recruitment process is very cumbersome, and it leaves uh, employers, especially in today's tight labor market, really struggling to find the help they need with their ever-changing uh, demands from their own clients. And a lot of this is based on the fact that we've got uh, a recruiting process that hasn't really changed meaningfully in a long time. It's still very paper and pen based, posting to job boards, uh, scheduling and payrolling is often still done on spreadsheets. And uh, this is where Blue Crew really hopes to come in and, and help. Uh, Blue Crew is a on-demand mobile staffing app that instantly connects employers with open, eligible, screened, and available uh, crew members that are looking for work. So with the pervasive adoption of smartphones, we're really looking to streamline the process of companies finding the help they need when they need it. We've seen some pretty awesome traction so far. Uh, we've grown from the Bay Area to uh, 20 different cities, but I think what's really cool about what we've done is that we're seeing traction outside of these major tech hubs. So some of the biggest markets that we've been able to help employers find uh, folks looking for work is in places like Reno, St. Louis, and even in central Pennsylvania where we launched uh, last summer. I know that uh, automation is often mentioned in reference to folks uh, potentially losing jobs or getting their jobs replaced, but at Blue Crew, we leverage automation and software to help companies fill positions faster. So rather than having a recruiter pour over resumes phone screen candidates and do this all one by one. We leverage a, a ranking algorithm that we built uh, in-house that uses uh, data on our platform to allow these positions to get filled automatically with people who are available and ready to work. With the remaining time I have left here, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of like the larger themes that we're seeing within the hourly workforce and how automation uh, should impact that and the workplace of tomorrow. Uh, the first point I wanted to make was that the hourly workforce itself and their desires are changing. So companies like Uber and Lyft did a really good job of making work more accessible and flexible to those that want it. I don't think that they necessarily innovated on making the taxi driving job materially better or more lucrative. What they did was they pro provided very easy access to that type of work and allowed people to work that in a way that they wanted to and have control over it. The same goes for DoorDash with delivery driving and Instacart with grocery shopping. So we did see this really large growth of the gig economy that gave way to you know, about a third of hourly workers engaging with it and wanting to find work in a more flexible way that suits them. The second point at play here is obviously automation and the impact that it can have in replacing uh, the job of an hourly worker. Uh, while I believe that it's certainly going to replace some jobs, I don't necessarily think it's going to result in a net loss of jobs. 
A lot of companies that invest in uh, automation within their warehouse facilities are also at the same time expanding their workforce. So what's extremely important uh, here is for these companies to make sure that they're not leaving their workforce behind by training and upskilling them to prepare them to work in the uh, workplace of tomorrow. One of the kind of cool things that we're doing at Blue Crew to try and help with this training problem and preventing a skills gap is we've developed our own uh, points and uh, incentive system. So as people through Blue Crew uh, work shifts and get positive feedback from companies on our platform, they're able to accrue points and use those points to redeem uh, things like career coaching and paid training. And it's our hope that things like this will allow, to, will allow companies to be able to sort of systematically invest in upskilling and training uh, their workforce. So uh, in, in summation, I'm, I'm, I think it's really important that as automation and robotics and AI kind of pose this threat to replace certain jobs in uh, the hourly workforce, it's really important that companies focus on, if possible, offering flexible and more accessible ways to work within uh, the constraints of their business and also really focus on the training and upskilling of their workforce and uh, at Blue Crew we're, we're happy to help however we can. So uh, thanks for your time and uh, it's fun to be here, appreciate it. All right, thank you Gino. So now, I'd love to just highlight one thing really quick. Blue Crew is launched here in York County. It's, that was something that came out on our early calls. Yep. So that's a thing that's in the process here. All of our guests are going to be around. So please chat with them, figure, pick their brains a little bit, and uh, figure out what you would like to uh, work with them on. I know we could, we could get some training. And, you know, AI, I don't know how I'm going to work with getting AI in, in health, but I like it. So let's do that. Um, and I think there could be some projects for you in York. So. Let's, uh, let's give them all a warm um, round of applause, and please, um, we're going to bring on the next group now, so <laughs> great, thank you.